and what gaps need to be filled. What is needed to obtain useful resource and demographic maps and communicate these to policy makers and the public. What are the capacity building requirements to fill the urgent need for technically qualified sustainable development professionals? I request you all to come and join us on the stage. Thank you. Uh. Hi, how are you? Good, good, good. Thanks. Good evening, and uh, at the beginning of the session, I'd like to uh, a big round of applause for Dr. Khosla, because what he thinks today and does today, the country and its cabinet ministers do tomorrow. So in the next few weeks, you are going to see a blitzkrieg of uh, the government officials going to Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh and uh, trying to assess the situations, trying to start a fresh beginning. And uh, I'm so glad to be part of this process here as uh, the founder of Go News, uh, that when they go there, they'll have something very substantial in their hands in terms of the document which can be uh, presented and very valuable document which is going to come out from these two days of deliberations here. So thank you very much. And uh, I was not supposed to moderate this part of the discussion. I was supposed to be on panel and it's a conspiracy that people must have got a wind that uh, my views on this subject are not so moderate. So uh, that's my uh, job for uh, next uh, 30, 40 minutes <clears throat> and uh, the task at hand is to talk about resource mapping, natural, physical and people. Vijay ji is not here, who was, he was talking about the capital of five kinds, so three kind of capitals we are discussing here and that's natural, physical and people and the most important thing is how to map this and how do we know what do we have in our hands in terms of uh, our resources and how can we mold those resources, how can we use those resources, how can we not misuse those resources and that won't be possible until we map them. So I'll keep my not so moderate views for the later part towards the end so that also uh, helps some people to stay on. And uh, three things we are going to discuss here. What sets of reliable data are available in these regions? That's Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh. And what gaps need to be filled? That's very important. Unless we know that how many students are there in class 10th, we won't know that how many graduates are going to come out five years from now. Simple. What is needed to obtain useful resources and demographic maps and communicate these to policymakers and the public? That's very important in terms of uh, the new realities in the Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, uh, where after the uh, bifurcation and uh, the state turning into union territory, a lot of institutions which were there, like the Un uh, Women's Commission, Human Rights Commission, they've all been now, and also a number of uh, uh, corporate beings which were there. The state held companies are now uh, a repository with the central government. So these are the resources we are talking about. The third thing is, what are the capacity building requirements to fill the urgent need for technically qualified sustainable development professionals? And that's the most important part. Because unless we have people, we can keep talking about uh, 
what we can do, what we want to do and how we'll do it, but unless we have people to execute those very complex uh, needs, we will get nowhere. So, without, uh, I'll, uh, without much ado, I'll uh, uh, invite uh, Prof Professor Deepankar Sen Gupta, who is uh, with the Department of Economics, Jammu University. And uh, he'll, uh, I think, we talk about the human resource which is there, which are the students. And uh, please come on, sir. Sorry? Anurban? Okay. Change of uh, this thing? Ah. Arunab Ghosh, CEO, Council on Energy, Environment and Water. Uh, that's also very challenging in the days to come. Please come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pachori. Thank you, Dr. Khosla, um, for inviting me. Um, I feel uh, a little bit like an interloper because I had warned Mr. Dr. Khosla that I perhaps know the least on the subject uh, with specific regards to German Kashmir. And as a researcher, it's my job to um, be upfront about my own limitations. Uh, but given the topic, uh, I was requested to talk about the broader risks and opportunities and how we might be able to um, learn from what's happening within the country and outside in a very uh, stressed natural resource environment and what lessons from there could be applied to uh, Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. So I am going to, although this is focused on uh, mapping out the resources, um, and I'm quite certain that uh, the speakers on the panel will be able to give you the specific tools by which to go about doing that, uh, whether it's natural or physical or human. I wanted to take you to the complete other extreme of what happens when things go terribly wrong with regards to a changing climate, especially in a very vulnerable area. And unless we keep that in mind, any kind of resource mapping that is static for today will not suffice for the developmental uh, solutions that we design for the future. So let's start with just understanding what are we as a species doing to the planet and what is the planet likely to do to us. Globally, we are well on track for well over three degrees Celsius uh, of warming above pre-industrial pre uh, era. Now, it seems like three degrees is something we are very comfortable with. We manage with far greater ranges in just a city like Delhi. Uh, so what's the problem? The problem is this is an average. And when we start looking at specific regions, especially say high altitude regions, then those averages don't help us, don't guide us very well. We already know, just in the last two months, that India has actually now uh, climbed up to number five from number 14 in just one year, from 2017 to 2018, to being one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world. So in 2017, we were number 14. By 2018 data, we're number five. We also know that on a high emissions pathway, and this I'm quoting from my book on climate risks, the incidence of extreme drought affecting cropland could increase by 50% in South Asia over the course of the century. The incidence of extreme, um, the incidence of uh, a 30 year flood becomes three times more frequent in a river like the Indus, and six times more frequent in a river like the Ganga over the course of the century on a high emissions pathway. So when we have these broader understanding of what's happening globally, how vulnerable India is, and how bad it could get for India as a whole, how should we then start thinking about how could Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh get affected? Again, from research that has already been published, not just from my institution, many others, this region 
has already surpassed the world average temperature rise of about 0.8 to 0.9 degrees Celsius. This region has already recorded 1.2 degrees Celsius rise above pre-industrial era. So we are so we are talking about a region that is vulnerable because it is actually the curve is of a different measure than what the globe is facing as a whole. The region has also shown a rising trend in extreme warm events over the past five or six decades, a falling trend of extreme cold events, and a rising trend of extreme values and frequencies of temperature-based in indices. And this is data from ISIMOT. The region is vulnerable to climate change because it poses serious threats to agriculture, horticulture, water resources, tourism, many of the issues that we were discussing in the previous panel, habitats, forests, and wildlife. There are about 250,000 hectares being used in the region for wheat cultivation, 210,000 for maize, 110,000 for rice. All these get affected by even minor variations in temperature, let alone on what, uh, with regards to water availability. The deficit in food production in the Kashmir region alone has reached 40%, while the deficit uh, for vegetable production has reached 30%. So when you add to that the vulnerabilities that we're talking about, we're looking at a far bigger problem. Now the question that was posed by Mr. Pachori and for the panel is, if we know certain things, what do we not know? And this is also where we'll have to do a lot more um, mapping. So uh, Mr. Ramadurai, who also happens to sit on the board of the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, knows this sort of uh, parable, but I'm going to say it to you. Imagine a frog that is boiling in a pot of water. Right? And the frog calls his science advisor and says, feeling a little warm. You know, what is, what's going to happen? And the science advisor says, well, in the next five minutes, the temperature is likely to rise by about five degrees, plus or minus one degree. So this is, and, and the science advisor is not wrong. In fact, the science advisor must give a range. Uh, there is no absolute certainty. So the frog carries on. But what if the frog changed the question and said, I'm feeling a little warm here. What is the worst that could happen? The science advisor would then say, well, the worst that could happen is that you will boil to death. In 10 minutes time, it will become unbearable for you to be sitting here. And if you still manage to hang on, it will take just a few more minutes before you boil to death. Now, the reason I say this is that the way we frame the question will determine the way we map the resources. General Sullivan of the US Army said on the battlefield, and I'm looking at a former soldier, uh, on the battlefield, we prepare for the worst, and then we hope for the best. And at CW, a few years ago, we had organized a war game dealing with climate risks, involving generals, admirals, scientists, diplomats from many countries to exactly understand once we start posing the question how bad it could get, then what are the questions we should be asking in terms of resource mapping? So let's keep that in mind now. What do we not know? We know, for instance, from Isimod, through its Hindu Kush Himalayan region program, that extensive research has been carried out in the region. But downscaled models, downscaled data models for Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh are still missing. And what do we mean by downscale? It means you have high resolution analysis uh, to be able to have incisive decision making tools. We also know from the UN Disaster Risk and Recovery Report that the Kashmir floods um, also stated that the scale of the damage in the Kashmir floods could have been aver averted if proper regional and transboundary early warning systems had been functional. Again, we were referring to early warning in the earlier panel. The Ministry of Earth Sciences has launched the Integrated Himalayan Meteorology Program. Maybe some of the panelists here are involved with it, um, which has installed 
high-end automatic weather monitoring stations. Now, in 2017, there were just 27 such stations. This has now increased to 43. But you can see that basically the number of stations that we now have are still very few for the size of the region that we're talking about. And based on long-term data collection, then only you will be able to do long-term forecasting or scenarios. So the sooner we start collecting the baseline data, the faster we will be able to at least have some reasonable ranges of estimation. Finally, we have very little scientific data on the extent of climate change that is already occurring in the region. DRDO's uh, Snow and Avalanche Study Establishment uh, has begun work in this area through its program called Him Parivartan, but a lot more has to be done. So we know on average things are going to get bad. We know on average things are going to get pretty bad for India. We know on average Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh is actually ahead of the curve, and that's in this regard is not a good thing. And we now know there are still a lot of baseline information at a high resolution that we don't have. Which brings me to the final bit that I wanted to say. How could we then communicate these risks better? Because no pol political leader or policymaker is now going to wait for another 15 years before all the information comes through. So the number one thing we have to communicate as I reiterate, uh, said earlier as well, and I'll reiterate, is start getting, collecting the high resolution da baseline data yesterday. We got to start it immediately. So if, if Mr. Pachori is saying in a few weeks' time there's going to be uh, a delegation going forward, this has to be number one message. Right? Uh, number two message, and this came up in the previous panel, so maybe I'm just repeating. What we don't have in terms of scientific measures, we have in terms of community learning. Whether it was in terms of the shepherds that Mr. Ravi Singh was referring to, or many others in terms of traditional knowledge. Let's start a program, if it doesn't already exist, and I'm confessing my ignorance, of quickly mapping resources or reserves or traditional knowledge in the region. Right? So on one hand, we're establishing the monitoring stations for baseline measurement. On the other hand, quick beginning to map uh, and codify the traditional knowledge that exists. The third thing we'll have to do is establish a process, and I will reserve my judgment on what is the best institution on the, under the current political configuration of the region, where that can be done, but establish a process for regular biennial climate risk assessments. Means every two years, there is to be an update on this. And you do it in three ways. Apply the principles of risk assessment. Means you're assessing risks with regards to your objectives. So if I'm, it's not just general risk. My objective is horticulture development. Then I have to map the risks against that. If my objective is tourism development, then I have to map the risks against that. What do we basically wish to avoid? Identify your biggest risks and the worst case scenarios. Consider the full range of probabilities and then take a holistic view. Second, broaden the participation to do this risk assessment. Of course, scientists and researchers will be needed. And of course, the, for instance, the institutions that already have data or if there are public sector enterprises there that already have data have to be included. But we also have to include, as I mentioned earlier, communities. We have to include um, uh, sociologists, anthropologists, a range of different actors that come together to have a better understanding of risk assessment. And finally, report this to the highest decision-making authorities in the region, whatever they are today or whatever they might evolve into tomorrow. So I won't going to conclude. I know I have perhaps taken um, uh, the 10 minutes that you could have used to learn specifically about the region, but I, I have confessed my ignorance, but I am bringing to you the basic message that this region we know is vulnerable, but we don't know how much. So let's get that basic information going, because without that, any decision we take today will not suffice even for a 10-year horizon, let alone the century. Thank you. Thank you, Anra. That was uh, really like frightening 
and uh, bad news uh, rolled out first. Every plan, every uh, policy, uh, I've been told as a, pol as a communication expert that every policy has to, has, has to have its first step in rolling out the communication about the policy. Otherwise, by the time you start rolling out the policy, no one knows what's going on. And that's happened a lot, especially in Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh and the rest of the country. Uh, uh, thank you, there are a lot of gaps and we need like a daily bulletin sort of a thing on the way you are going about like we have on AQI and uh, um, temperatures and different cities and all that, that what is the risk level of which region today kind of a thing. We'll reach one uh, a day once we have the technology to do that. Uh, now uh, on to uh, next uh, gap. In 2004, the GER, that's General Enrollment Ratio of Higher Education in Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir, the state of Jammu and Kashmir was 10%, 2004. In 2015, it became 18% when the rest of the country was only 15%. In 2019, it's now 20% when the rest of the countries marched ahead to 27%. So this is a uh, resource. This is the young people we need. So what's going wrong in our education policies in Jammu and Kashmir? Uh, are there less colleges? Are there less universities? Are students going out? Are students not enrolling enough? So we have uh, educationists with us. Deepak. Thank you. Uh, can I have my uh, presentation, please? Okay. Is there a pointer? Uh, let me begin by thanking the Club of Rome uh, India Chapter for inviting me for this. I accept it with some trepidation because, A, I must confess, I'm a pariah out here. I'm somewhat of a Climate change skeptic, I mean, climate is changing all the time. I doubt, you know, I mean, I'm not too sure how much human action has to do with that particular thing, number one. Number two, uh, I, would, I was heartened by uh, Sharad Marathi's presentation because it appears now that a guy like me who is market-oriented also possibly has a place uh, in these deliberations. Now, with respect to data, let me give you a classification. If you want a macro data, land on land, et cetera, et cetera, budgetary data, macro data is more or less reliable. It exists. When it comes to micro level data, exactly what the government spent on various issues, that is possibly one of the best pieces of fiction that you can possibly find in India. The northern states can compete, but it's pretty bad. The other thing, is when, see, the other data that you require for micro planning, if I want macro planning, with the macro data, I can, can come up with a sensible macro plan. But if I want to do micro planning, both as a government as well as a businessman, then I need to map certain things like local cultures, local traditions, local knowledge. And while we have anecdotal knowledge of those particular incidents, Unfortunately, the process of documentation where Jammu and Kashmir is concerned has been extremely poor. That is why what I am going to do is basically take a look at some of the resources of Jammu and Kashmir and basically arrive at an evaluation. Look, if you take any Jammu Kashmir digest, you want macro data, you will get macro data. Then what good am I for? I will try to basically evaluate those resources the quantum, at least the physical quantum of those resources are well known. But as to the quality of those particular resources, an economist will have a particular uh, thing to say when, it, when I uh, put it uh, in front of some uh, fairly object of, objective or reasonable criteria. Now, where do I? OK. Now, resources have to be evaluated within a context. And here the context has been given by the conference. What is the context? Sustainable, inclusive and green development for Jammu and Kashmir. Now, I asked myself, th th these are good words, but the question is the market economy has its own dynamics and you want to optimize something, there is a particular strategy. Is this compatible with the market economy? 
notions of competition and urgency to create uh, employment in Jammu and Kashmir. And it turns out that at least in my opinion, in the context of Jammu and Kashmir, it is. You want to do something about Jammu and Kashmir, you want it to work, you want it to create employment, then it turns out that this, for Jammu and Kashmir at least, this is the way to go. Now you may ask, is there any other state where it is not the way to go? We will have that argument later on. Now, let's have a preliminary look. These are facts that you can get in any uh, digest on Jammu and Kashmir. That 2,22,000 also includes half the territory or more than half the territory that is in uh, Chinese and uh, Pakistani hands. The population 12, it's probably 4 now. And the density is 50 kilometers. But once you have taken away the Union territory, I mean, the, that's the new map according to the Jammu Kashmir, amended Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act, then, of course, the Union territory of Jammu is somewhat smaller. Population density is, of course, somewhat larger. And, of course, uh, Ladakh is as is before. And these are the districts, the divisions, and the terrain. As you can see, it is largely still a hilly state. I mean, even when you take Ladakh away, which is entirely hilly, with a plateau thrown in, Jammu Kashmir, except for the southern sliver, remains more or less a hilly state. Now, what is it? It's a hill economy. Until recently, 40 to 50 years ago, primarily an agrarian economy. In 1980, agriculture was 47%, by the way. So it's only now it's become 16% because services have grown, and they've grown largely for artificial reasons, not natural reasons. Now, it was... The tertiary sister sector was one, but tourism once played a major role. Now it's a small part of the service economy. Now, what are the consequences of being a hill economy? A hill economy is a high cost economy. In Jammu and Kashmir, it is compounded by poor governance. It is compounded by poor management of public services like water, poor infrastructure. But the fact is, even if you take care of these particular problems, Jammu Kashmir would still be a high cost economy. That is, you can't get away from that. And this is a common feature of all hill economies, national or international. Himachal, Uttarakhand, etc. face the same problem. Countries like Switzerland also face the same problem. Now the question is, what do you do? What do hill economies do? How do they compete? And the fact is, they do not. They seek out niches depending on their advantages, traditional knowledge, customs, etc., etc., where customers are willing to pay more. Now, in the context of Jammu and Kashmir, it means that those two UTs should concentrate on those goods and services where a similar advantage exists. Now, it turns out that in the context of Jammu and Kashmir, these areas, be it handicrafts, be it tourism, they are all extremely labor-intensive. I mean, tourism's multiplier happens to be very high. Handicrafts, of course, is a labor-intensive craft. So, labor-intensive is extremely high, which means at least inclusion part is taken care of, unless, of course, it leads to a situation where you actually have to get labor from outside and make them work out here, not to be ruled out where Jammu and Kashmir is concerned. Uh, and, of course, the environmental part of it is not so natural. This requires government oversight and regulation. I mean, it's not natural that the tourism out here is going to be environmental sustainable. For that, a carrot and stick policy is required. A lot of learning is required. Sorry. No, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. The it's, it's become very small. Now, given this context, let me evaluate its resources, land. First is that entire area, 2 lakh plus. That doesn't matter. The amount of arable land is fairly limited, and it's there, uh, 24,000 odd kilometers, square kilometers. Now, if you look at the net zone area and the net area irrigated, that's important for us, then the proportion of area irrigated happens to be extremely small. How much is it? It's roughly 44%. That is around the national average. And it is ironic because when it comes to water, the resources of Jammu and Kashmir are actually plentiful. There are problems with that uh, water, but the fact is, in spite of this, it is plentiful. Now, this is the consequence of the Indus Water Treaty, where the rivers, the waters of the Chenab, cannot be impounded 
for agricultural use. So what you can do is basically to lift water from the Chenab, you have to do lift irrigation and we are I think under the treaty up to 1 lakh hectares or 40,000, oh, sorry, 1 lakh acres or 40,000 hectares can be uh, uh, irrigated but we don't do that. Jammu Kashmir does not do that. It does not also draw its share from the Ravi river. There is a paraj at the uh, Shapur Kandi where it seems that the entire river Ravi takes a left turn and the river flows to uh, Punjab from the territory of Jammu and Kashmir because Jammu Kashmir has not taken the necessary canals, built the necessary canal network of canals to irrigate its Kandi areas. So that is one of the reasons as to why the net irrigation area zone as a uh, proportion of total land happens to be hovering around the national average, which is low to begin with. What are the consequences of this? The consequences of this is also low productivity. It turns out that if you look at rice, wheat and maize, the productivity figures per hectare roughly hover around the national average. But the national average is low to begin with. So in that sense, there is land available, but Jammu Kashmir does not make the most of it. There is water available and Jammu Kashmir does not make the most of it. Now, this is horticulture. The same problem prevails. This is some sort of a map. Which region grows what? For example, we know that most, many of the, sorry, many, some of the village, uh, districts of the valley grows apple, pears, etc., etc. They are widely spread around the valley. Some of the highland, highlands of Jammu also grow the same crops. And then you have some crops that are grown in both Jammu as well as Kashmir. And the last will give you what is grown in the districts of Leh and Kargil. Now, let's come to this. Let us look at what is grown. Now, these productivity figures cannot be compared to the rest of the states because these crops by and large are unique to the state of Jammu and Kashmir alone. So if I look at its productivity with respect to other countries where these crops are grown, then again productivity happens to be extremely low. But what is most important is basically exports as a percentage of food production. Look at that, 84%. This is a resource that is given to you and unfortunately practically no value is added. All of it is exported to the rest of the country. Now the, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because many of the value added activities actually causes the fruit to lose weight. These are weight losing processes and therefore it would have made sense to add value within the state itself while exporting it to the rest of the country. Instead, the crop is actually transported to Punjab, unlike in Himachal Pradesh, where value is added. So, a resource exists, but because of certain problems, the ones I have mentioned out here are irrigation facilities. There is also lack of technological inputs. I'll come to this later on where institutions of the state like the SQAS, the Agricultural Science and Technology, have not played the role that PAU say has played in Punjab or HAU has played in Haryana. So as a result of this, what happens is no value is added. Of course, poor ease of doing business happens to be another factor as to why no value is added to this particular resource. Now let us, something, let us look at something that de depends on traditional knowledge. When it comes to handicrafts, the exports as officially stated is 1000 crores. Actually, this is an underestimate. When you talk to people in the Jammu Kashmir bank, where much of the money actually comes in, they say it cannot be less than 2000 crores. They say it must go at least goes to 3000 crore rupees. And those, those are possibly credible figures. Because if you look at the numbers who are actually engaged in this, it's four lakhs. It's very unlikely that production would be just 2,000 crores if the number of people engaged were 4 lakhs. Because they don't appear to be poor, at least on phys you know, when you see them physically. So it is likely that output and val volumes are much, much higher. But yes, there is certain things going on. For example, the younger generation is reluctant to get into this particular trade. 
So this resource, which is a human, is a human resource, because traditional knowledge is basically embedded in human beings. This particular resource is now facing attrition. It is depreciating, and it is very likely that in the coming years, the number of people who actively seek their uh, livelihood in this particular industry, which basically requires or utilizes l l traditional knowledge, will become uh, lower. Tourism. Again, this is one particular area which you can talk about. It's a resource. The number of scenic sites that you have is a resource. Now, if you look at tourism, then if you look at the tourists to the valley, it's in a normal year, sorry, this is not this year, in a normal year, roughly about 12 lakhs. If you look to the uh, tourism to the uh, Vaishnav Devi, it's 8 million. The difference between the tourists who go to the valley and the tourists who come to the shrine is they come to the shrine and they go back the next day. They do not go to other parts of Jammu. So the amounts that they spent is actually fairly low. And if you look at the social composition and the economic composition of these tourists, they don't have actually much money to spend. In contrast to the tourists who come to the valley. The valley is expensive. So in a sense, it is appropriate tourism economically because it is high value but lower volume. And there is no doubt that carrying capacity even in the valley can be doubled. The valley can have twice as much tourists because what tourists do when they come to the valley, they land in Srinagar, they go to Pahalgam one day, they go to Gulmarg the other day, they go to the Sonmarg the third day and then they go back. There are other places in the valley, Yusmarg, etc., which are as beautiful, in fact more beautiful than a ruined Sonmarg, where in the meadow itself, the government has allowed hotels to be built, ruining it completely. So that can easily be done. Now, you can also create a similar circuit in Jammu. What is the problem? The problem is the following. It's a problem even now, that when it comes to solid waste management, sewage, water supply, the valley is in a mess. By the way, in the last census, it was found that scavenging is practiced in Srinagar. Now, when, we, when officials were confronted with this, they said, no, no, they use mechanical scoops. That is scavenging. Whether you use it hand or mechanical scoops, that is scavenging. But this is something that doesn't percolate to the average administrator in Jammu and Kashmir. That is a shameful thing and has to be eliminated. So these are areas which require investment if you want to double the capacity of this particular resource. Now, I'll show you some pictures and those familiar with Jammu and Kashmir need not answer. It's to those who do not know what Jammu and Kashmir is. Here are some photos. Where are they? Which place is this? Actually, they are all in Jammu. No, 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 Shara Vashara nahi hai. Okay, let me go back. That's Badarwa. Okay. This is also Badarwa. This is basically Kishtwar. Okay. This is Padri Top, which overlooks basically is the pass that will lead you to Himachal Pradesh. And by the way, the road is now complete. Yeah, it's complete. There's a section of the Himachal part left yet. But the Jammu part is complete. This happens to be Sarthal. From, there's a place called Bani in Kathua district, which is very close to the Himachal border. If you climb up, you come to some sort of a pass. This is basically one of the tributaries of the river Ravi. Uh, and this, of course, happens to be the town of Punch. That's again Sarthal. So, you can easily develop additional circuits both in Jammu, in many parts of Jammu. Now the question is, it requires infrastructure. This is a resource, but it requires infrastructure. It requires transport, provision for water, waste and sewage management, as well as governance capacity to handle tourism in a fragile environment. And we have a living example in front of us. That is the shrine of Sri Mata Vaishno Devi. 8 million people visit a single spot 
and yet what Jagmohan created, Governor Jagmohan created, he created an institution which can actually handle this in a financially self-sustaining manner. That shrine is so rich that it supports a university and helps to finance part of the government's deficit. So, the other thing, land. Is there land available, is land available for industrialization? Now I'm talking about land in Jammu. You go to any government official, they'll say there is no land in Jammu at all for industrialization. What they mean is that there is no land in the industrial estates. Because industrial estates follow the road. The main road that we have is an arterial road that runs from Kathua all the way till Srinagar. So all our industrial estates are basically located, located along that particular road. This, there are other roads, there are other places where land is available. Unfortunately, no roads go out there. And how bad is this? Look at the road network in Jammu and Kashmir, compare it to Himachal, compare it to Punjab. Punjab, a normal state. Himachal, a hill state. You look at the length of state highways in Jammu Kashmir, it's 67. Now, there's a reason for this. Because of strategic or security reasons, most of the roads that connect district headquarters in Jammu Kashmir happen to be national highways. So let us look at the other roads. Road density of the PWD roads and so on and so forth. The density in Himachal Pradesh happens to be 25.31. Kilo, uh, in Jammu Kashmir, it's 5.6. Okay, we are twice the size of Himachal Pradesh. Double it. It will become 11.2. So fact is, it is not shortage of land. It is the non-availability of roads which enables or ensures that Jammu Kashmir is not able to exist a particular resource and that resource happens to be land. Now, institutional resources. Have the SQUAS been able to play the same role as the Punjab Agricultural University? SQUAS, by the way, is the Shere Kashmir University of Agricultural Science and Technology. There are two of them. One in the valley, one in Jammu. Till today, the entire apple rootstock for Jammu and Kashmir has to be imported from outside. And this is decades after the establishment of these SQUAS. Productivity, as I told you, is still low across sectors. Part of it has to do, of course, with uh, irrigation facilities, but part of it because no interventions have been made in this area to boost uh, productivity. And yet, there are some entrepreneurs who have actually succeeded in using the uh, services of scientists from SQUAS. For example, we talk about niche areas. And one firm that has done very well in this regard happens to be a brand called Sarveshwar. It basically makes basmati rice from R.S. Pura. He's been able to do this. He has been able to hire the services from scientists from SQUAS to standardize crops. He's been able to take their help to ensure that the spices he receives are completely organic and standardized. He markets it on the name of Nimbark. This is saffron. This is all kinds of masala which are extremely niche oriented. And HN AgriServe is owned by a gentleman called Aurangzeb Khurram, two minutes, who basically has been introducing high intense apple orcharding, which uh, Dr. Karan Singh talked about, in the valley. Whose help has he taken? He's taken the help of these scientists. So the ability to exist, but the institutional capacity to use that ability, unfortunately, is a huge problem. Now, Institutions are important. If you want to break new ground and move towards a knowledge economy, the role of institutions is paramount. The first question is, can you do so? Now, as I said, there are several centers of academic excellence who are very good at producing papers. And we know that privately hired, they also can do stuff on the ground. But what they cannot do, have not been able to do basically is dissemination. And this region is a biodiversity hotspot. Bioresource is rich and varied. This energy, this sector is not energy intensive. It's not infrastructure intensive. It's mobile and fluid, has a definite life cycle, and doesn't require much change in laws. The problem in Jammu Kashmir always has been institutional inflexibilities. Uh, the lack of soft infrastructure to cater to professionals from other regions because you cannot be a closed society. Now, you have to move uh, these uh, things. You have to 
kick, uh, kill two birds in one stone. You need to bring in soft infrastructure that caters to niche tourists as well. Now, the knowledge economy is generated laboratories. As I've said, our unities, universities do quite well in this particular regard. And here, you need the help of the capital market. You need venture capitalists, you need angel capitalists to introduce our scientists to what can be done and to link them with the wider world so that they are actually able to step out of their labs and enter into some sort of startups and do business. Uh, let me just... Now, the thing about skills, you talked about education. Higher education has been leaping, growing by leaps and bounds because today every panchayat practically has a college. The enrollment in those colleges may be 50 or 60, but there is a college. When I first came to Jammu and Kashmir, there was a massive shortage of colleges. Now there is a glut of colleges and a glut of universities. Everybody wants a university in his backyard, as Dr. Karan Singh pointed out. But look at the state of skills. I am looking at employment potential. Food processing, you see that violet thing is basically skilled labor. Of all the labor that is in, uh, see, is into food processing, look at the fraction of how few people are actually skilled. Look at handicrafts. What a small proportion of workers are actually skilled. And this particular lack of skills is endemic. So education levels have been rising. Gross enrollment ratios have been shooting up. But if you look at skills, which are our natural resource, the valuable resource, it is very bad. So does the potential exist? The hard infrastructure exists where skill is concerned. F marry formal skills with education. And by the way, in the country, it is only now that an NSQM is basically having an impact. Jammu Kashmir, of course, has not taken up in a major way. So to sum up, the UT of Jammu Kashmir has the resources to ensure development that is high income as well as sustainable development. Okay, you need an appropriate policy, but because of poor governance as well as institutional weaknesses, these, so far it hasn't happened and it is here that policy makers have to direct their efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Deepankar Sen Gupta. That was really illuminating. And uh, I would hope that these kind of presentation would be circulated to people here who are participating and uh, do that. Yeah, so it becomes part of that uh, uh, knowledge vault which we need. Uh, that was a really, really uh, optimistic picture of what Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh could be. Uh, the pessimistic picture. Uh, being a journalist, is that Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh today, the per capita income is that of Benin in Africa. It's $820, which is half of India's. So you can imagine that 5 million, there are 5 million youth in Jammu and Kashmir who are college going right now, which is the population of, I think, Finland or something, and the population and uh, with the per capita income of this. Now, why it's not happening, what uh, we have, uh, uh, everything you've said is known to everyone, but it's not happening for the simple reason, Niti Aayog came out with their report on business reforms index in uh, 2015 was their benchmark. And in that, Himachal Pradesh had overall implementation 23.9%, which is just bordering state. And Jammu and Kashmir, uh, overall implementation was 5.9%. 23.9 .9 to 5.9%. And those, there are reasons uh, for that which uh, we'll discuss. Uh, I keep going back to education because it's the fourth goal in SDG, which is really higher up. And yeah, and we keep talking about that. Uh, and we'll get back to that. Knowledge economy you talked about, we'll discuss that also in uh, uh, detail. Uh, I also have some things to say, but before that, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Pankaj Srivastava, who's with the Department of Geology, Jammu University, and uh, please, uh, uh, with your, do you have a presentation? Yeah. Okay, so with your presentation.
So, at the outset, I thank Club of Rome for inviting me to speak on the mineral resources, which, which is one of the treasure of the Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. And uh, if we go to any literature on the Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, the first sentence on the mineral resource is written that it's divided of the mineral resources. But it's not true. This is the uh, map of Jammu and Kashmir, but since geology doesn't know the boundaries, geographical boundaries, so I just, in next slides, it will be complete Jammu and Kashmir will be there. As you know, Himalaya is divided into four, conventionally it is divided into four uh, zones, parallel zones, and they are right from bottom to top. Shivalik foothills are the outer Himalayan zones, lesser Himalayan zones, greater Himalayan zones, and trans Himalayan zones. And uh, again, they have the different altitude and uh, mountain hills are there in there. All these uh, mountains are present. But uh, in Jammu and Kashmir, all the four zones are available. But clearly in Ladakh, you have the three and four zones. The first two zones are not there. But in Jammu and Kashmir, all the four zones are there. This is about the geology. Geologically also, UT of Jammu and Kashmir and UT of Ladakh, they preserve almost complete geological succession, succession from right from Proterozoic, that is the oldest kind of rock, to the recent kind of rock. They have, and we are fortunate that we have such complete geological sequences. And this is one region that uh, these scientists from all over the world comes to these areas to do research. And uh, again, because we are talking about the uh, capitals, this is also one of the region where the geotourism can be promoted in this particular area. And uh, Ladakh is one very good example because there you have the evidences of the collision of the Indian plate with the Eurasian plate. And uh, people come to see that particular zone. Here, uh, we, we have tried to put certain kind of mineral resources uh, in throughout the geology, uh, throughout the UTs of JNK and Ladakh. See, uh, when we say that uh, Jammu and Kashmir or the uh, Himalayan states are divided of mineral resources, but at the same time, if you see the Union Territories of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, they are the sole holder of one of the main treasure of the country, that is the sapphire. Also, the borax and native sulfur, they, they are the sole uh, uh, holder of those resources. And uh, borax and sulfur is uh, present in Puga Valley of Ladakh and sapphire in the Padar that is the Kudi Valley of uh, Kistwar. Also, the coal deposit, that is the tertiary coal deposit, the only semi-anthracite kind of coal are available in Jammu. Other resources like uh, you have the limestones, different grades of the limestones are available, gypsum was available, uh, now it has gone back into the reservoir also. And at least 33% of graphite resources, 23% of marble resources, and 14% of gypsum are available. Other metallic and non-metallic resources are also available in Jammu, Kashmir, and Ladakh. So, sorry. But when we come to the production side, uh, this is the recent data published in November 2019 about the production. 
and the uh, limestone uh, is produced from Jammu and Kashmir and then 89% of the production in terms of the rupees, uh, in terms of the money comes from the minor minerals. So even very good deposits are available but they are not being mined. Uh, we will talk about that, why they are not being mined. There are very few mineral-based industries, mostly on the cement basis. Cement industries are there. So, some, cal <coughs> sorry, some calcium carbide industry is also available. And now we talk about the uh, sapphire deposit. That is the uh, very good quality of the sapphire is available in uh, Jammu, Jammu and Kashmir in the Padar area, that is in Kestwar district. This sapphire is uh, such a beautiful sapphire that uh, a generic name has been given and that generic name is the Kashmir sapphire. In gemstone industry, the generic name becomes very important. Why it is important? Because certain gemstones are uh, become very, very costly if they have a particular origin from a particular deposit if they are present. All the uh, sapphire from other part of the world, like uh, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Brazil, if they have good color, blue color, velvety blue color, they are being sold as the Kashmir sapphire. But in, uh, so this is uh, the sapphire, and uh, it is known, uh, you will be surprised that it, it is known to us for last 100 years. But somehow, the real exploration data is not available. Its extension, mineral body extension, how it is extending, what is the geography of that uh, mineral body, it is not perfectly known. So for last 100 years, we know and we are mining this deposit, but still a lot of uh, resources are left there. This is a very, very tough area where, which is open for the mining only for uh, two months only, two to three months, and it is on the cliff side and therefore it's very hard to mine.